What is this new era we're talking about? It has to be a new era where fossil fuels are left behind, where this system is left behind, where we come together, and this is what I'm seeing with people like you, but it has to go beyond these walls, it has to go into all of our hearts, so. Copenhagen. This is so wild. And one of the things I noticed about the city, other than the fact that it's just like insanely gorgeous, is like all the different sustainable aspects about it. I know I've heard about that, but even like when I first came into the airport, like there's a sustainable fashion shop and also like some sustainable fashion advertisements. And also just like the ease of transportation was just magnificent. And even for me now being in this hotel room, I was like, um, I was trying to figure out how to like go to the pool. Apparently the pool is sustainably heated with excess heat from the hotel and also um, they give you like sustainably made slippers made out of recycled rubber tires. And that sustainability aspect is actually why I'm out here. I'm here for um, the Global Fashion Summit, which is this amazing sustainable fashion summit that's happening here in Copenhagen. Um, I also know that Copenhagen in general just like tends to have like a lot of like more sustainable brands that are based out here and designers and I feel like they're really forward thinking with a lot of that. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of it and to be invited to this conference to attend as media press. You heard that right, folks. Your girl's a press girly now. <laughs> um, but the conference officially starts tomorrow. I came in here a day earlier just to like kind of settle in and not be like super jet lagged coming straight from like the airplane to the conference. So I think I'm just gonna settle in tonight. And then tomorrow I think I'm gonna do a little exploring before the conference officially starts. I would like to turn to you because your work very specifically highlights the unequal exchange and the power dynamics between global north and global south, specifically sort of through fashion. Would you elaborate on a little bit, a little bit on, on why and how you're doing that and what kind of partnerships you're building to, to ensure that? Ah, uh, the big word here is um, inequalities. It's not an inequality, it's a dictatorship. Um, I operate in Uganda, in Kampala, and we are experiencing a clothing dictatorship whereby the dictators are Europe and the global north. So we don't have a say. Um, I don't really think I can talk about partnerships because a partnership is about dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's about exchange, it's about respect, it's about understanding. Um, and we're just on the receiving end of rubbish, basically. So there is no partnership when there's a sign on a door and the door says closed. As somebody who makes clothes in a country like Uganda, I'm upcycling clothes that were disposed in our country, um, and I'm you know, selling them on my online shop to Europe. 
and Europe is imposing taxes on these, so you can't take care of your waste. I'm repurposing it, I'm selling it back to you, and you're charging import tariffs on it again. So is this a partnership? Is it a dictatorship? Um, what, 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 what's really going on here? I think that's a question for everyone to reflect a little bit about um, today, because I think Obviously, with the alliances for a new era and with this whole idea that we have to come together and we have to, we have to work together in order to, fix, in order to fix things, there's this very, and I, I would say Eurocentric maybe, narrative that a partnership is always sort of an equal exchange or there's always sort of this mindset of being, you know, we give and we take and everybody gains something. And when no, we're talking about true. exclusionary practices, that isn't the case. Yeah. So that's where we need to have that conversation. Um, would you maybe just briefly tell us a little bit about how you created your, uh, how you created Buziga Hill, and, and as a reaction to to what you've already set the stage a little bit? Yeah. Bit so um, Uganda grows world class cotton. For those who don't know, um, I moved back home to Uganda to create a brand using sustainable, sustainably grown Ugandan cotton. And after four years of research, I realized that it's not possible because our industry has never really recovered from the peak levels of the 1960s and 1970s. Why hasn't it recovered? Because, of course, we had political instability, but in the meantime, the Europeans came along and decided they'll create charitable actions to donate their clothes to us. Secondhand clothes are so cheap. As a designer, there is no way I can compete against secondhand clothes. It's just not possible. So what I did was to react to the situation. And with Buziga Hill, we're just trying to open a conversation. I mean, I'm glad I'm here. I don't know if Uganda has ever been part of this um, alliance that you all are calling it. I don't see an alliance here. I see dictatorship, clothing dictatorship. And you know, I'm here to make friends with all of you, but I'm also here to say, wake up. Um, I'm being slapped in the face left and right, slapped in the face with the clothes coming in, slapped in the face with import taxes. And then I arrive here, and I'm on the metro yesterday, and all of Denmark, it feels like, is wearing single-use T-shirts. Yesterday was the Royal Run, and why does everybody need to wear a Royal Run T-shirt? Do you know where that's going to end up? It's going to end up in Ghana. It's going to end up in Uganda. Why? Why? Even the organizers of this event, many staff members are wearing single-use T-shirts. That's bullshit. Give them, a, give them a badge or something, a mm. sticker. You can throw that away. But don't throw your T-shirts. Don't throw them in our direction. You know, I say every single item of clothing that comes from the Global North to Uganda is saying, you can't produce this. We can't give you value-added jobs. Mm. Stay where you are. Know your place. Take your rubbish. So my climate story actually began more in the culture space. So I spent my first years working in uh, New York City, where I'm from, uh, working at different art and culture and fashion publications. And as the climate crisis has grown in severity, I was more and more interested in the question of why storytelling around climate has always been through much more of a data-driven lens. And me and my co-founder, Jake Sargent, we were really interested in this idea of, can we apply some of the creative storytelling that we often see in fashion and in the arts more towards the climate space? So it was all an experiment, pretty much from the start. And what we have learned across the last four years of working on Atmos is that stories with heart are always the ones that resonate more than anything else. You know, you can hear a statistic and it might not move you because the sad reality is that we are all confronted with so many shocking statistics every single day. You hear the human story behind these statistics and it moves you. That's what actually creates change. I don't totally believe that you can change people's minds, but I do believe that you can change people's hearts. When you tell someone that the earth is suffering, they become paralyzed. But when you remind someone of how much there is to love about the earth, that motivates them to act in a completely different way. My name is Aditi Meyer, and I had my start with climate justice, and it was a journey 
very much linked to labor justice. And I think it's because it was a journey of understanding how all of our systems need to be interrogated, especially when it's a culture of exploitation and extraction. So I was very much catalyzed to think about fashion as um, an industry where we can look at the politics of labor to the environmental impacts of fashion and how it was disproportionately affecting communities of color globally. And so that became the catalyst to understand fashion through the lens of the history of colonialism, racism, and again, a larger system that was predicated on speed and scale at all costs even human lives. And so fashion has been my chosen vehicle to look at climate justice and everything else within that. You know, when we talk about climate doomism, it's often a way to give way to legitimize a feeling of inaction, which is what the folks in power want, right? Is to feel that the individual is stripped of their ability to act. So that's one thing we need to address. And I think it goes into this larger conversation of hope. And now hope must and will coexist with grief, but grief can also be the driver to protect what we love. And grief coexisting with hope can be the driver of what is the vision I want to build for this world. Because at its core, climate do Climate doomism exists because we have a crisis of imagination. And so if you can engage in that radical work of reimagination, I think that's the future. So I believe that there needs to be a shift from just having conversations and discussions to more action. Yeah. Um, and conversations are great. And I think that we can have conversations as we are taking action because it's really important to be knowledgeable, right? But I think it's important for, we need to do more in regards to, you know, being deliberate and actually focusing on implementation. So we need to hire more people of color, more people from diverse backgrounds in senior positions, right? Because when you're in a senior position, you are in a position to actually create change. So it's not looking at it from a point of view of just placing people in like DNI positions or just placing just one p person from a diverse background to say, okay, you can come and represent everyone else. Because an example is, I'm a black British Ghanaian woman. I was born and raised in London. My parents are from Africa. People might say me and Ngozi look alike, but Ngozi is a black and American woman with a Nigerian background. You have Ray right next to me, who is again a Londoner like myself, but comes from a Bangladeshi background. So if you were just maybe employ myself, I don't represent Ray. I also don't represent Ngozi. So I think it's really important that when we're having these conversations to actually think about what type of voices we need to include, and also thinking about not just including one voice, but having many people actually implemented within these spaces. I think that, you know, yes, we have similarities, but again, we have different um, backgrounds and experiences to be able to share. And I think that's really important is to have conversations, but alongside having conversations, it's also actually creating action, which is what Nina is doing with her team over at CSF as well, was that we're still having conversations, but they're actually implementing and actually creating action to create change as well, so yeah. Yeah, because a lot of the times when conversations around decolonizing happens, a lot of people aren't really engaging with the conversation and kind of walk away from it thinking, so what do I do? And if you don't know, employ someone who does. <laughs> mm. I think that I, I want to step away from the word decolonization, because if we talk about decolonizing, we're looking just at the construct of what already exists. Mm -hmm. And what exists now in terms of fashion education was bet, uh, built on a particular set of objectives and values and goals. And right now we have a different set 
of objectives, values, and goals, primary among which is saving the planet, right? And so then if sustainability, if environmentalism, if uh, labor rights and, and human rights are core to what we're trying to do now, then we need to develop a curriculum that represents that. And so at Custom Collaborative, I created a curriculum based on our values. So I think that first and foremost, we need to reevaluate our values and start from there. Um, but I think that what we stand to gain is the possibility of creating leaders in the field who can imagine another way of profitability besides overproducing mediocre clothes and hoping that whatever sells, sells. Yeah. Right? So we can create people um, who are able to think critically and imaginatively and understand how to make things, why we make them the way they do, um, fashion history beyond fashion history and museums, but really the history of the fashion industry and how we got to this fast fashion and ultra fast fashion disaster place. So, so I think that we have a lot to gain. I think we just need to listen to what young people are telling us and engage them in the conversation about, about what fashion education should be as, again, we look to our shared values to create responsible, useful curriculum that will actually create clothes that fit and affirm all bodies and make people happy to wear and to keep. Mm. Um, I think it's quite interesting to see an activist on here, so thank you for opening the space for me. Um, and if we're talking about science-based targets, I think I want to remind a little bit of the science to people before I talk about where we are. There's 150 species going extinct per day. Extinction rates are rising by a factor of 1,000 above natural rates. By 2070, it is expected that 19% of the world will be uninhabitable because it is too warm. The C40 estimates that if we don't reduce our emissions, 800 million people in 570 cities will see le uh, sea level rise, and 1.2 billion people will be climate refugees by 2050. We are talking about 2050 targets, we're talking about 2030 targets. There is no business on a dead planet. There is no business with no nature. There is no profit with no nature. The fashion world is still, you know, producing 100 billion pieces of clothing per year, 92 million tons of textile waste, 10% of global carbon emissions, and I still hear companies here wanting to grow. We are already using 1.8 Earths, meaning that we're using nature's capacity 1.8 times faster than it can regenerate. What are we growing into? There is no place to grow into. We can only grow in consciousness, we can only grow in courage, we can only grow in empathy, morality, and creativity. And that is why we have to take the science seriously. Because when we set these targets, and we've talked about this before, there were $100 billion committed by countries around the world for the, south, um, for the global south, that money is still nowhere. When companies have these commitments, when governments have these commitments, there has to be pathways to get there. And I, that's why I think science-based targets are so important. Mm. But at the same time, we have to keep each other accountable, and we have to keep it real. I am 20 years old. These are the badges of the conferences that I've been to since I finished school less than a month ago. One, two, three, four, five. I shouldn't be doing this. I am 20 years old and I'm fighting for the planet to stay alive. I really didn't want to get emotional on stage, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I need you to feel it. I need you all to feel it. 
We are um, on the pathway to irreversible um, impacts. And everybody here is operating in business as usual. What is this new era we're talking about? It has to be a new era where fossil fuels are left behind, where this system is left behind, where we come together. And this is what I'm seeing with people like you. But it has to go beyond these walls. It has to go into all of our hearts. So um, I think the point of everything that I'm saying is that we won't stop holding companies accountable. And we want you to listen to the science, listen to the people who are on the street. Because we're in this together, and we cannot give up. We cannot keep delaying. We cannot keep making promises. We have to see action. And I know that you know what that action is, because there's, com there's uh, organizations like Global Commons Alliance putting that together. So yeah, join us and listen to your children, because we are not OK. We are not having the childhood that you had, and I want my children to have that childhood as well. Thank you. to gather my thoughts. I think it just kind of made me reevaluate like what is fast fashion's role in the sustainable fashion movement. Um, I do think I might come out with an article on sustainable baddie later which I'll link below if I do. Um, I think the hardest part is like not walking away from this conference with a perfect solution but I don't know. I think more than anything it was really nice being able to find so many people who are trying to find those amazing solutions like I was able to meet people from like all across the globe there was various like garment uh, like worker or like garment manufacturers who are from Bangladesh I get to meet up some of my like favorite like climate baddies um and just like so many connections were made and I think that that was like really special because again like when would I ever be in the room with those people so I'm hoping to do more work with those various people who are in Copenhagen and also just like people like around the globe who are working on the sustainable fashion movement but I think just like I just think in travel in general it always opens up your worldview and I think being able to be there and hear different perspectives of people who were there um it was able to open up my worldview more with the whole sustainable fashion movement in general so 
yeah um i know this video was a bit much a little bit heavier than usual but you know as is life um but i hope that this was like helpful for y'all um as much as it was helpful for me if you guys have any questions or thoughts i would love to hear your guys thoughts like down below and continue these conversations because again i think of these conversations as long as they're coming from a place of like really wanting to build and learn and grow i think will be really productive for what we're doing and maybe they're like maybe you're someone who's starting something or is doing something that like you want to find connections like please put it down below like i would love for y'all to even connect with one another as well and don't forget to check out part two for all the fun stuff because i also do fun things in copenhagen so yeah i'll talk to y'all later